Today we've got Barry speaking. Uh, Barry Mill is the director of Compass Research Centre, as many of you will know. Uh, he has a master's degree in psychology from the University of Otago and a PhD in psychiatric epidemiology from King's College London. His main interests are in life course research, uh, survey research, and the use of administrative data to answer policy and research questions. Uh, today, he will be talking about work currently underway to simulate the impacts of policy interventions. Thank you, Natalia and Kia ora um, Yes, so um, I'm going to be talking today about something that we at Compass have been working on for nearly 20 years now, um, led by uh, Peter Davis, started off on this on this track, and I sort of joined about 10 years ago working on some of these projects. Um, and I'm going to focus, talk a little bit about what micro simulation is, how it's being used around the world a bit, and then in New Zealand and what we've done at Compass uh, over the past 20 years, and then focus in on a model that we're working on at the moment in relation to the Better Start National Science Challenge. So this work is funded as part from the Better Start National Science Challenge, and um, it is modeling um, some of the interventions that have been de developed as part of the Better, uh, uh, Better Start National Science Challenge. So just to acknowledge everyone who's been involved here. So I'm going to be talking about um, a simulation related to, so the Better Start National Science Challenge, sorry, just to give you some context, uh, aims to improve the health and well-being of children aged uh, from or zero to 24 year olds. A 10 year project beginning in 2016, or eight year project, I suppose, finishing um, middle of this year. And three main substantive themes, successful learning about education, uh, healthy weight, and resilient teens uh, about mental health. So each of them have a um, intervention that they are working on. The healthy weight one I'm going to talk about actually uh, preceded uh, uh, Better Start National Science Challenge. And this sort of lists off all the people that have been in involved in those what we call themes in the Better Start National Science Challenge. So successful learning, Gail Gillen, Bridget O'Neill and, and Megan Gath have been helping me with the Better Start Literacy approach. That's the um, intervention, if you like, that they've been working on. Um, healthy Weight, Rachel Taylor worked on um, prevention of overweight infancy uh, study, um, and that's what that we've worked that into the simulation model as well, as well as some work that uh, Sarah Mason has been doing on smoking and pregnancy. And um, this is a work in progress, as I'll explain to you, uh, but we're also working in one of the digital inventions that the Habits team here at the University of Auckland have been working on, uh, one called Stress Less. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that later, and um, work on that has been undertaken by a lot of people, including Carolina Stasiak, um, Sarah Hetrick, and Ruth Williams. In terms of the modelling we've been doing, um, the modelling I'm going to describe uh, has been put together by Kevin Chang and Eileen Lee, but I also want to acknowledge Chris Ball at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, who helped us with the method to get a synthetic data set. Um, released from the Stats New Zealand um, data lab, essentially, to give us a starting population for a simulation. I'll explain why that, that's important. Um, and through the years, lots of people listed year, there at Compass have helped out with the simulation modelling. Oliver and Jessica putting together the, the programming, really, to allow the simulation to work. Uh, Nicola and Steph worked on some simulations of the Knowledge Lab of the Early Life course. Uh, Roy, Janet, and Peter and, and Martin have worked on lots of different models um, at that point and prior to that point as well. Okay, so um, the basic idea here is, or the basic problem that we want uh, simulation for, is we want to evaluate the impact of a policy change or an intervention. And you could just do the policy change and an intervention and then wait to see whether it works or not, but that's probably cost a lot of money and it may not have worked and so you waste a lot of people's time. So the idea is simulation, which doesn't have to be micro simulation. I'll talk about micro simulation is specifically, but simulation offers the possibility to model interventions on a virtual world. So you create a virtual world that looks as much as you can, like the real world, and that you run little little experiments on it. And uh, if you do your job well, you can model the complexity and model associations, associations pathways that go on in the real world. It's always going to be a simplification, but Hopefully you do a pretty reasonable job here. Okay, so micro simulation, the micro means we're, we're simulating micro level units, which could be people, it could be businesses, could be any other individual thing. So the idea is we have a collection of individual things, in our case, people in our simulation model, 
And we simulate each of them. So each of them can take a different path. And you simulate it a number of times, as I'll get onto in the next couple of slides. And uh, the path that each individual uh, unit takes can change across those, uh, those different runs. And you average across runs to, to get a sense of what's going on. So typically, you use empirical data as a basis to simulate real or alternative worlds in their futures. Or if you don't have empirical data for how you think the world might work, you can make plausible guesses and plug that into your simulation model. And the, and the advantage of it is you've got this virtual lab set up that you can run experiments on. And the world is your oyster to that extent. You can run whatever experiment you like on it. Um, so um, to create this virtual world, um, in this case, a virtual world of individuals, individual people, we start with a real or at least realistic sample of people. And for our the models that I've been working on uh, over the past, uh, I suppose, 10 years at Compass have always started with a synthetic population of New Zealanders. So we make up people that look like real people in New Zealand, but aren't actually real people in New Zealand. And then we use that as the basis of a simulation and we simulate what happens to them over time and run some experiments on that. And uh, simulate what happens over time. So that's where we apply the stochastically derived rules to reproduce patterns via stochastic process. So different things may happen each time you do it for different individuals because it's based more or less on more or less on probabilities. So uh, people run through the simulation and at various points along the track, they have different probabilities of things happening to them uh, or them being a certain way, probabilities of them being a certain way, and they may or may not be a certain way or, or something may or may not happen to them. And based on that, some other, that might take them on a different path. At this point, you've got a, a virtual world. And what you can do is predict what might happen if conditions were to change in that virtual world by altering the parameters in a certain way. So consider this simple made up example. Suppose every child born has the same probability of attending early childhood education, and that probability is 0.5. You've got a 50-50 chance of attending or not attending. But based on whether or not they do attend, they've got a different probability of leaving school with qualifications. If they do attend, they've got an 80% chance of leaving school with qualifications. And if they don't, they've only got a 50% chance. And as I, I'll stress, this is made up just for the purpose of showing you the type of thing that microsimulation does. These sorts of things, the 0.5s and the 0.8s, are called transition probabilities. The probabilities that drive the change from one state to another state. And they, ideally, they should represent real transitions, uh, real probabilities in the real world. These ones, as I say, are made up. And it's a stochastic process, so it's random, so you get different results each time. So on each simulation run, different units may be simulated as both attending early childhood uh, childcare education or not and leaving school with qualifications or not. So imagine two individuals, Abby and Brian. They both start with the same probability of attending early childhood education. That's part of the model. It's 50-50 it's chance. So we roll the dice and see where, how it comes up. And on this particular run, Abby is simulated as going to early childhood education, and Brian is not. Then based on that, they've got a different probability of leaving school with qualifications. Abby's is 0.8 and Brian's is 0.5. And then we simulated that again, and Abby's got an 80% chance, ends up she does. Brian's got a 50% chance, ends up he doesn't. And that's the, way it work on, that's the way it works on that particular run. But if we do it a second time, we may get a different result. So starting off with the same probabilities, the 0.5 for... Um, uh, going to early childhood education. Suppose this time both were simulated as not going to early childhood education. 50-50 chance. It means now they've got a 50-50 chance of leaving school with qualifications. And on this particular run, the way the dice have been rolled, Brian ends up uh, leaving school with qualifications and Abby doesn't. Okay, so that's kind of the way it works. We've got, in this case, we're going to get two runs and two individuals. But you can imagine a situation where thousands of individuals and lots of runs, and the deal is that it's best to take a number of runs on average. And this is, a, this is a really simple example that I just did in Excel. Uh, but for five runs and 20 units, um, I got an average of 10.2 uh, out of a 20 attending ECE. Uh, the expected value there is 10, right? 50%. And then on that basis, 13.2 uh, out of 20 left school with qualifications. 
Now, this is where the virtual lab part comes in. Suppose an intervention is suspected to increase the probability of children attending ECE to 0.8. So there might be a policy intervention that funds early childhood education places, for instance. But the probability of leaving school with qualifications remains the same contingent on whether or not they attended early childhood education. 0.8 for attenders, 0.5 for non-attenders. What would happen if we implemented that policy change? So we run it through again, five runs in the 20 units that we've developed, Abby and Brian and 18 others. Um, before, we had 13.2 uh, out of 20 um, leaving school with qualifications. After the change, that shifts up to 14.8 out of 20, an eight percentage point increase. Okay, so that's that's an estimate of the effect of that policy change on something way down the track, leaving school with qualifications, based on those made up probabilities there. But you can imagine this with real probabilities in there and a lot, a lot more complex, complex model as well. So uh, a very simple model of which simulation is probably not needed, but I, I took you through that to show you an example of how micro simulation works. It does work on the basis of, of um, uh, transition probabilities, but that can be generated in a number of different ways. This was just a roll of the dice. And in others we use, and the ones that we use, we tend to use um, regression type models. Um, and they're also, you also might simulate not just um, binary events such as going to, to early childhood education or leaving school with qualifications, but you know something um, continuous like an income or something like that. Um, so um, you can imagine using that as your starting point, building a model around that that had lots of different factors that affect EC attendance and association with school qualifications through lots of different pathways. And micro simulation allows you to capture this in one model and allows counterfactuals to be tested. Just taking a step back here at the, mo uh, at the moment, um, micro simulation uh, doesn't tell you about what the probabilities are for um, attending ECE or leaving school with qualifications. It'll simulate what you give it. So all those, inf all those uh, parameters that you need for your model, you have to get from somewhere else. This is just a tool to um, run, th crunch things through to see how things turn out in different situations. So how's it being used? Um, I just re I recently just scanned the International Journal of Microsimulation just to get some examples of the types of things microsimulation are being used for. Um, often there's an economic focus. Uh, I should say that it developed uh, uh, Guy Orcott, um, early 50s, I think, economist, developed the technique of microsimulation. So it did, still does have um, quite a role to play in just working out what things cost. So this example here. Um, uh, someone, uh, I don't think they're based in the UK actually, but they uh, simulated the cost of basic income in the United Kingdom. So simulated what might happen uh, under various situations uh, in terms of uh, what a basic income would cost and I guess well, how that might affect people's engagement in the workforce and the tax they pay. Another one uh, based in the UK, so a dynamic microsimulation model of aging and health for aging and health. And this is a common one, actually. There's a lot of microsimulation models on uh, focused on retirement, particularly, uh, and um, fact, and around retirement, sort of aging and and um, the health implications of aging. And Compass, I worked on a few models like that as well. And then just a final example there: simulations of policy responses during the COVID nineteen crisis in Argentina. So there, various policies, I guess, were being considered in Argentina, and this simulated through what those policies might do in terms of um, important socioeconomic indicators for the um, Argentinian population. So that's that's just gives you a flavor of the types of thing that micro simulation has been used for. It is used relatively widely, I would say, in New Zealand. I'm just going to run through four examples, um, but there are more than these. And this is based on a, a um, paper being put together at the, at the moment by um, Sarah Pinto and, and Verity Warren about uh, the current state of microsimulation models in New Zealand. And uh, thank you, uh, Sarah and Verity, for allowing me to use some of these descriptions. So this is the one that's probably, I, I would guess, is probably most used in New Zealand, the, the TAWA model, the Tax and Welfare Analysis. Um, it's basically a, a model based on the uh, Household Economic Survey of the taxes that people pay. Um, and it models, models the effect on particular, uh, sorry, potential policy changes on individuals and what they will earn and what they will pay 
and scaling up those results so that they representative of the New Zealand population. So this ran out of the Treasury. The MSIM model run out of the Ministry of Social Development. Um, it's essentially modeling the benefit system. So it simulates um, eligibility and payments for both past and current MSD clients and will run scenarios about if there was a particular change that will affect benefit and eligibility of payments, um, who would win and who would lose out of that, and um, what would it cost the country, essentially. The Monty model, which I think is still in development at the Ministry of Transport, uh, is modelling the travel movements of 10% of the New Zealand population across a 24-hour period. And I think wants to do quite, well, look, wants to do interesting things with it. It aims to answer how a particular policy change uh, that might affect uh, traffic, for instance, is expected to affect travel behavior one, but also the social environmental impacts of such a change. Okay, so as long as you've got reasonable guesses for each of those things, you can use a, a simulation model to, to give you the answers. And just finally, Te Ara Putama Mō Te Reo Māori, um, which is uh, put together by Te Matawai, which is, a, I think, a community group that's promoting the Te Reo language. Uh, te Tara Whiri i Te Reo Māori, which is the Māori Language Commission and the Ministry of Education. Um, and what they are doing is forecasting the number of Te Reo Māori speakers from now through the 2040. Um, to understand who is speaking to Ma uh, Te Reo Māori and where, um, as well as how certain um, uh, policies or interventions to revitalize the uh, Te Reo language might affect the number of speakers and where they're speaking the language. Okay. And then, as I say, at Compass, we've had a 20-year or so history of putting together simulation models. May have preceded this one. I'll give you an example of, of six or so, but... First couple on aging. Uh, so primary care in the aging society uh, with uh, Peter Davis, Roy Leigh and Janet Pearson. Um, that was simulating the practitioner's uh, system response uh, to an aging society. And then building from that, there was the balance of care in the aging society. And that was uh, when I first joined Compass, that was uh, still being finalized, that model. Um, and what that model wanted to look at is the extent to which the balance of care, so whether or not um, care is is, <clears throat> is provided by the home and formal care or provided by something that, that the state has to pay for uh, or someone has to pay for, retirement homes, et cetera. Um, and given that in association with um, aging and age-related mortality, how the balance of informal care versus formal care can lessen the impact of um, uh, those conditions and the cost of those conditions on the health system. Modeling the early life course, uh, that's the first one that I became involved with. And it was also the first one we actually started to put these models into, um, into a, a, a computer program that you can kind of play around with and um, present to people and, and show them and say, hey, have a look at this. You can play around with the um, parameters here. That model, children from age zero to 13, using data from the Needham Christchurch uh, Development Studies and the Pacific Island Family Studies, with some input also from the T or Nukodoa Best Outcomes for Māori Study, to look at outcomes in the early life course and what may impact them in terms of um, healthcare attendance, um, conduct problems, and uh, there's an education one. I can't remember what the education one was now. And then we kind of built on that for the knowledge, the knowledge lab of the early life course. And this is one where uh, this is still running. It's a bit out of date, but it's still running. So you can go to that link there and play around with it. There's actually a user's guide built in there as well. Um, so that extended the MELC model uh, through to age 21. But rather than using estimates that we derive from analyzing longitudinal studies, we use best, best estimates from systematic reviews um, to generate the transition probabilities essentially from one state to another state. And then as part of his, uh, or for his, in fact, James Cook Fellowship, um, Peter Davis uh, led the New Zealand as a social laboratory model, which again, you can have a look at there. And that modeled the New Zealand population from 1981 to 2006 and tested a series of policy counterfactuals based on this policies that were implemented um, during that time in New Zealand. And what if they weren't or weren't implemented as fully as they 
as they had been done. And, and a book became of that, simulating societal change. Um, crikey, that must be uh, five or six years ago now, that book was released. And then this this one, the better start, what we call the better start model, which I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation now. And as I mentioned at the start, the idea of this was to take some of the simulations, sorry, some of the interventions that were developed as part of the Better Start Natural Science Challenge and put them into a microsimulation model. And on top of that, not part of the microsimulation model, outside of it, you can look at things like cost. So what are the costs of these interventions and what sort of cost savings would there be? Okay, so this is pretty much what I'm going to talk about for the for the rest of the presentation. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the Better Start Natural Science Challenge has three substantive themes. I should mention the fourth one, of course, because I, I lead it, which is called the Big Data Theme. So we sit across the other three substantive themes, successful learning, healthy weight and resilient teams, themes, to um, run some mostly whole population analysis, but do other things such as simulation here, um, to answer important questions in relation to successful learning, healthy weight, and resilient teens. And what we aim to build into this model, um, and we've done three of the four so far, is one for successful learning. So um, Gail Gillen and Bridget McNeil um, have developed the Better Start Literacy approach there at the University of Canterbury, uh, which I'll go into shortly, but it's an approach that improves um, early literacy and in fact, does a really good job in improving early literacy, and we're modeling both that and its effect on later reading comprehension. There has been consternation over the past three or four years, but I think it's been bubbling for a while about the sort of declining performance of New Zealand school children. And uh, the one was reported last year on the um, progress of early reading and literacy, the New Zealand's poor results there. So we actually programmed in a, a a uh, representative distribution of those scores and got an estimate of the extent to which early literacy affects that, and that's, that forms part of the microsimulation model. For, health, for healthy weight, um, some analyses Sarah Mason did, uh, where Wayne Cutfield uh, looked at the impact of smoking pregnancy on obesity, and then there's an intervention that Rachel Taylor developed called the Prevention of Overweight in Infancy. Had ser several arms to it, but the sleep intervention was the one that... Um, had the biggest, or had an impact really. So we programmed that into the model. And then one that we are in the process of putting into the model is the stressless digital intervention as part of the resilient teens, part of the Better Start Natural Science Challenge, as I said, and that's led by the Habits team at Psychological Medicine here at the University of Auckland. And they've shown some impacts on well-being. Okay, so if you were to go to that uh, link at the bottom, you'll see this. This is the Better Start, I've got things covering my screen, but it's the essentially the Better Start model. And it lists off the four things that I just run through there that are being modeled here, the um, literacy approach, the two on obesity and the one on uh, well-being. And off to the left-hand side at the top, you can see the different tabs you can go to. And I'll show you show you snippets of each of these tabs um, as I go through and show you what we're plan what we are doing with this. Okay, so this is the model input tab, for instance, and it basically shows you the types of things that we're modeling. So for literacy, we've got the Better Start Literacy approach affecting early literacy, and that in turn affecting literacy in middle uh, childhood. And in terms of obesity, we've got smoking during pregnancy, its impact, that's impact on, on obesity. I'm not going to show you that one, actually. Um, and also the POI sleep intervention, prevention of overweight and infancy sleep intervention, and its effect on obesity. Um, this is not, I'm not showing you this live, I'm showing this is just a screenshot, but if you were to hover over those um, arrows there, you'll get a sense of the estimates that we've derived or have used. And if you click on the arrow, then you get taken either to a paper that describes um, where we got the estimate from, or in some of those cases, analyses that have been done that show how we populated the model. So it's kind of inbuilt uh, documentation. Okay. Um, so the Better Start Literacy Approach is something that's been developed over the past six or seven years, or maybe even more, by Gail Gillen and others at the University of Canterbury. And it focuses on the systematic teaching of phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge, and it's training teachers to, um, to train their schools skills in uh, basically new entrants to school. 
Um, so there's a quote there from Gail Gillen from uh, one of the papers describing this approach. Teachers monitor children's response to the Better Start Literacy approach teaching and then scaffold, adapt activities or increase teaching intensity as necessary to ensure all children progress towards the next step for learning. And you can find out more through that link there. Um, and analyses we did as part of the big data thing showed that it had really impressive results here. So what we've got here is uh, kids who've been through the program, they're in the red, and kids who haven't, but are the same age of those kids who've been to the program. So you've got the age in months going along the bottom from uh, 60 months, which is five years, sort of 72 months, which is six years. You see those who've been through 10 weeks of the program leap ahead in terms of the proficiency in identifying sounds within words, essentially. So phonemes within words, and cat, that sort of thing. In fact, they reach at uh, five and a half what the kids who haven't been through it don't quite reach by six years of age. So there's a, at least a sort of six months advance there. And it affects, uh, sorry, affects, it has an impact on um, children of all ethnicities and all deprivation groups. This is being implemented widely at the moment, I should say. So it's this sort of stuff that we've programmed into the model. Uh, we did sort of more detailed analysis that I'm showing you here, or at least Megan Gaff did and sent, sent, sent those analyses to us. And that's when, what's being put in the model. So the other thing is that that gets you the arrow from better start literacy approach to early literacy. The other thing is there's a paper. I said, well, okay, can you can you give me any point me to any evidence showing that this early literacy has long term effects? And they said, yes, look at this paper here. And this paper here shows that depending on your early literacy, what you, your early literacy has a 0 0.39 correlation with your later literacy. OK, so, it's, so it has long term effects. So the idea is if we improve early assuming causality here. Um, idea is if we improve um, early literacy through the Better Start Literacy approach, that will have longer term effects to reading comprehension, essentially middle childhood. Reading comprehension is a thing that New Zealand was shown to be poor on, poor on many things, but poor on as part of the Pearl's evaluation that was last year or the year before. So we programmed that in from a paper. Okay, so um, this is the what's called the scenario builder part of the model. So if you look to the right-hand side first, we've, we've selected the better start literacy approach, or go to the left-hand side, sorry, step two, select variable to examine, better start literacy approach. Now go to the far right. The default setting is no one has been through this program yet. And the way you can play around with this is put a certain number of children through this program. So that's what we've done. 50% go through. So imagine 50% of New Zealand children go through the program. This is what we're modeling. And then we run run the scenario. Based on that, um, so these phonological awareness scores, which go up to 20, um, you can see, and I've broken this out by ethnicity to show that it has effects on uh, children of all ethnic groups. The orangey red um, uh, dots with the error bars there are the what is before we make any change, that's the bait, what, what's called the base scenario. So before we make the change to have 50% of the children go through the program, that's what their level of phonological awareness is. And then once you run the scenario where 50% of them gone through the program, remember we saw those dramatic effects before, that's programming those effects in. And here are the flow on effects to reading comprehension later. So based on the fact that we're, we're Estimating that there's a 0.39 correlation between phonological awareness in early childhood and later reading comprehension, that's the effects you would expect to see from putting 50, random 50% 50 of the population through the Better Start Literacy Assessment. Okay, but maybe that's not the way you want to do it. What about a tailored intervention? So what I did before is put 50% of the whole population through um, uh, or put them through and said that they got the better start literacy approach. But what we could do instead is we're going to target and actually just put 50% of children who meet certain criteria, in this case, um, based on deprivation. So we're going to target it to the most deprived children in the country. That's based on the children's deprivation status, so that's the deprivation status of the house they live in. It's not the same as a school decile, which has been discontinued anyway. That will be another way to do it, but this is based on the, the child, because that's the easiest thing we could, we could actually get when we when we um, got the, the base file out, we could get uh, their deprivation. 
So this intervention doesn't target, target the whole population. It just targets those who live in deprivation uh, quintile five, so the lowest 20% of households. And what happens there? So this is when we um, target it. Sorry, this is when we put 50% of all children through. And this is when we put 50% of children in the lowest depression quintile through. So you can see still an effect, but the biggest effect in uh, Māori and Pacific, in Pacific children, mainly because um, areas of, of New Zealand that are in the lowest quintile of deprivation have a tend to have a disproportionately large number of Māori and Pacific children. So inadvertently, those children are being, um, uh, being focused on uh, for this particular intervention. Okay, so that's the better start literacy approach and how the micro simulation model models that and you can target it to different sectors of the population. Uh, in terms of the POI study, the prevention of overweight and in infancy, um, which was a randomized controlled trial, which had four arms. I think there was a food and nutrition information, sleep, both, and then nothing as the four arms. The background here is there's a high prevalence of overweight and obesity in childhood in New Zealand and elsewhere. Work that we have done actually as part of the Better Start National Science Challenge has shown is that preschool obesity at least is going down in all groups in New Zealand. Um, there are long-term health consequences of uh, obesity. So obesity even early on tracks to obesity later and uh, consequent health, particularly cardiovascular health risk factors um, in later uh, adolescence and early adulthood. It's hard to change once established. So the question is, can you do something early on that will change the track for children? Short sleep has been associated with increased weight. So what a sleep intervention that aims to increase the sleep duration, reduce overweight and obesity in childhood. And it turns out, if you read this paper here from Rachel Taylor and others, it does. It odds, it, sorry, it halves the odds of obesity in those receiving the intervention compared to those who uh, got nothing. So we can probably go in, in here. So this is now the model builder part here. And this actually just shows you the model that we, we put together. So that's the full model actually. And, and the, when we finalize this, I think we're just gonna show the things that you're able to change, which be in this case, the, um, the sleep intervention. Um, so you can see that that's an odds ratio there of 0. 0.5086. And what we're gonna do here is run another scenario. This time we're gonna focus on, um, on the poor sleep intervention. Um, over to the right hand side again, you can see that the, the, the base is that no one has been through this intervention. And what we're gonna do is put, for the sake of argument, again, put half the population through this intervention. Want to see what would happen. Okay, so those are the results. Just, just for the full population now, you can see the um, prevalence of obesity dropped by about one and a half percentage points as a result of this intervention. That's just faithfully representing what this uh, paper suggested the intervention does. But another thing that you can do um, with the way we developed this micro simulation model, and this is actually a new thing. This is the first time we've, we've done this with um, the simulation models that we've developed is I wish I could read that. Can't read it because it's all up there. Um, what if what if the effect size is actually different and typically smaller than the research indicates? So it's a classic thing where uh, people run a, a, um, a, a great intervention study and they estimate the effect size will be a certain type and when they put into the real world, a certain size, and when they put into the real world, it's far smaller than that size because the real world tends to be a bit more uh, messy than... Um, than control conditions of a particular um, randomized controlled trial, as was run for the POI study. So you can just go in and change it here. So what I've highlighted there is the, um, the odds ratio that we got directly from um, that paper from Rachel Taylor about the effect of the POI sleep intervention. And we're going to just change it to 0.8. We're saying it's the, the, the odds ratio, it doesn't halve it, it only reduces it by 20%. And what's the impact there? And over onto the sort of middle of the screen, you have to calibrate intercepts. Otherwise, kind of the the prevalence of, in this case, obesity goes off on a on a different track than it should do. But work that up way mathematically to change the effect size here and have it feed through to the simulation. 
So that's what we had before with the odds ratio of 0.5. If you change it to 0.8, you can see a far smaller effect. Okay, so take these two things together. We can tailor an intervention to certain parts of the population and we can change the effect size um, that um, we program in there. Um, that means you can do certain things. We're saying, well, okay, this intervention, you sh it seems to work quite well across the board for children from different um, deprivation groups and children of different ethnicities, but I don't think it's going to work so well for these children. You can then, I'm, I'm not, don't show you an example of this, but you can actually then target a particular subgroup of the population and change what the estimated effect size is for them. If you have reason to expect, or you just want to test, uh, that there might be a smaller effect size for that group. Okay, so that's what we've modeled so far. I'll just talk a little bit about what we're in the process of modeling at the moment, and this will be ready to run in the next within the next month, I would think. So <clears throat> um, the Habits team have um, created a number of different digital interventions, a lot of, lot of chatbots, but other things as well. They actually developed one during uh, COVID. Uh, was the one called during COVID? Araha? I'm not sure. But anyway, they developed one during COVID. One of the set is called Stress Less. It was called Stress Detox when they first put it out there. So it's a chat bot. Um, so you kind of, you chat with it. You've sort of daily contact with it. So it's a 21 day program based on cognitive behavioral therapy and positive psychology. So the chat bot messages the user via the messenger once a day. And the, the user, I think, says the time of the day that they want to be messaged and guides them through a brief daily activity for 21 days. And they looked at this, um, this paper by uh, Ruth Williams and others, um, and showed that it improved well-being, uh, WHO5 well-being they measured in 20, 18 to 24 year old students. So just to give you a, a bit more detail of this, and as I say, well, I'm not gonna show you any results of the modeling because we've done the modeling yet, but just to give you a bit of a sense of what it does, this is, I think, that <clears throat> when you first kind of um, uh, get the chat bot and the chat boot bot introduces uh, itself to you and asks what your name is and then interacts with you as you go on. So these are kind of the 21-day things that they go through. And the first week is focused on um, physiological sensations associated with stress and anxiety. And then the week two, they focus on cognitive appraisal, appraisal of stress and anxiety. And in week three, the behavioral response. And going through this, what they find is that there's a, a reasonably sized improvement in the well-being of um, people who have been through the program. And that's what we're going to be modeling as part of the Better Start model. Okay. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. And I think I've left us a good amount of time for questions. Um, so uh, micro simulation is a flexible way to test the impact of policies and interventions. Lots of different ways to do things. Um, as I say, there's a lot, a lot of times have a have a um, economic focus and haven't done things exactly the same way that we've done them, but they all boil down to in a sense in one way, shape, or form transition probabilities. Um, the Better Start model tests interventions developed as part of the Better Start National Science Challenge. So um, the two I showed you were the Better Start Literacy approach on phonological awareness and later reading comprehension and the POI prevention of overweight and infancy sleep intervention, and also models in there the impact of smoking and pregnancy on obesity. To do is the stress less digital intervention. And um, you can target interventions, you can modify effect sizes, and it's all in a, uh, I didn't say this actually, but it's actually displayed in, in R Shiny. So it's a Shiny app that once you press the button in the Shiny app, it goes through and does a simulation in the background and then spits the answers back at you. Those graphs I was showing you were the results of pre pressing the button to do the simulation, the simulation running, and then that being spat back at you. Uh, so yes, you can target interventions, modify effect sizes, and do both if you want, and all within a Shiny app. It's And that's it there. It's still under development, uh, partly to put in the stress-less digital intervention, but we, um, we understand how it works, but we haven't actually... Um, put together a user's guide for it yet. We did put together a user's guide for a previous one, the Knowledge Lab model, and we can build off that a little bit, but there's a few little quirks in here um, that we'll need to put a, um, 
develop a user guide for, but it's there for if people want to have a look and um, can get in touch with me. I didn't put my email actually, but um, if you can touch with Martin or Natalia, I'm sure they can put you on to me, but that's pretty much what I want to cover. Thank you very much. This is a huge change for childhood obesity. Uh, that is, exactly. That was, yeah, and, that was um, a comment, mostly, sorry. I think um, there's a, that, that's a, that's a, a huge change and a relatively short-term change as well. Um, so I have to get in back in touch with Rachel Taylor, actually, because I think they've run some analyses on later, um, later impacts to see whether they flow through. Interestingly, when with the model for smoking pregnancy, the evidence out there is that whatever impact there is of smoking pregnancy on obesity lasts way into the future, so into early adulthood as well. So that's the way we've programmed it. Okay, you mentioned some ministries using microsimulation models. How common is usage amongst ministries to test their policy interventions? How can the models that you mentioned be used by ministries? Are they interested? Um, okay, how common is usage across ministries to test their policy interventions? Um, I don't actually know. I think that, again, the Tower one is the one that's most used about, um, you know, how policies that affect taxes, for instance, uh, and transfers may affect individuals and how much it's going to cost. Can the models that uh, I mentioned be used by ministries? Absolutely. That's the whole point of putting them into um, a model that anyone can use, anyone can go to and use it. Are they interested? <clears throat> I'll have to... Uh, I'll have to present it to them. Um, when we developed the MEL-C model, the Knowledge Lab model, uh, I went down and had regular meetings with um, different government agencies about those models. Um, but I don't think, and they weren't used. <laughs> um, so we um, showed them how they could be used and um, developed them and, and pointed them to them, but they weren't used. And to some extent, they might be because they weren't modeling things that they were interested in particularly so it wasn't the policy concern of the time what have we got there now we've got a sleep intervention we've got the better start literacy approach the better start literacy approach has received funding to um for uh, sort of a rollout more or less across the country so um you'd think the government or parts of the government should be interested in that i hope that answers your questions Can the IDI be used with your microsemi expertise? Seems like that is both a policy and research advantage that you have internationally. Um, it can. So there was a lot of, um, I think the Emson model uses the um, uses the IDI, but a lot, a lot of the models that I didn't cover use the IDI. So there's the Oranga Tamariki model. There's a justice model. There was various models, as you would know, Peter, um, that they um, put at tenders for um, during the previous national government. Um, but yeah, so people are using the IDI, um, and then there's a question of how you do it. Is do you do all your analysis within the IDI to get your transition probabilities, for instance, and then take all of that out and put it in a user-friendly interface that we've we've got so people can use it? Um, and that's probably the model I favour, and that means it can be more widely used, or you can develop everything. You could you could set up a micro simulation model in the IDI. I don't know how Emsom, um, for instance, I think that uses the IDI. I don't know how, how Emsom works. I have a feeling it is outside the IDI. Um, it might be touched on actually in that um, that working paper that I mentioned before um, by Sarah Pinto and Verity Warren. But you're right. That's something that um, we've got that other places don't. The question was, do I, I guess, do I know if there or if it can be used to predict things such as people's political behaviour? Um, and I don't actually know whether it has been used for that, um, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, and I think a quick Googling might um, just answer the, the question. Okay. What other policies are you considering simulating in the future? Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop and ask, answer that question first. Um, <clears throat> for this, no more, because it's very much tied to the Better Start National Science Challenge. But what I showed you, it's it's modular, essentially. You can keep adding things in there and and then you're simulating it at that point. Uh, as uh, So there is there's potential to do that. Is there any potential for linking with other New Zealand models? That would depend, I think, on um, the structure of the models and the people that we're simulating. So we, I don't think I went into this in great detail, but we, we have a synthetic population of 10,000 children um, who match the children born, uh, who was age zero, essentially, uh, born? No, born in 2013. Um, so 
that's that's how we that's who we model and it's what's called a closed cohort so it's just them no one enters and no one leaves and that's you know to some extent unrealistic because you've got immigration you've got children moving out and you've got children dying in some cases so there'd have to be um i mean they'd have to, it's certainly possible but you'd have to think through and it, it can't just plug in now i think that's maybe what i'm getting at you'd have to rejig things um one thing is causality. If your comparison group is different by key compounders, how do you fix that? The question, the question is, you don't. Um, the, que the, the approach is you, um, if you're concerned that there might be a degree of confounding, you can change the size of the estimate. So if you think, and, and actually taking a step back as well, Peter, one of the, um, that was one of our justifications for using systematic reviews as part of the knowledge lab model, is that in theory, their best estimates that have taken account of uh, confounders and average across um, different studies that have done things. Um, so if if someone says, "Oh, that's rubbish. This is this is full of confounding," I think it's only twenty five percent of the size of what you think it is. Fine, adjust it so that it is five percent of the size. So as I say, it's not a replacement for epidemiology or the um, social science work that has that, that has been done. It it uh, uses that information and puts it into a model. If the information is wrong, you need different information, basically. And uh, that's one of the reasons we developed as part of this, the ability to change estimates, which we which we talked about and always put in the too hard a basket when we were working on these sort of five to 10 years ago. Gibbo Wong, uh, can you micro simulate natural disasters? I imagine you can. Um, you'd simulate, uh, that would be an in interesting simulation, actually. You'd simulate... You could simulate several things. You could simulate the the natural the effect, the geological effect of the natural disaster, or geographic effect of the or climate effect of the natural disaster. And um, you know, you imagine having a model of New Zealanders live where New Zealanders live, and then you can simulate the impact of people and what if they stayed home and what if they went to high ground or whatever. So yes, you certainly can. Again, whether anyone has. It's one of those things where I think it, they probably have, but I don't. I don't actually. You know, I can't give you an example. Yeah, uh, Peter says in the early days we tried to start a regular meeting in Wellington of people interested in microsim. Yeah, we did. Um, that was arranged through us and NZIER actually, um, and that's what I wondered if what might whether that sort of thing might happen when Social Wellbeing Agency got basically asked people. Um, you know, tell us about the micro simulation models and the status of them. So um, sort of a community of practice, if you like. Um, that wouldn't be a bad thing to start up again, actually, because, uh, you know, government, as is, is, is often said, I'm not saying anything new here, government considers, government agencies are sometimes siloed from each other. And being in academia, we sometimes siloed from government agencies. So a community of practice wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea. I don't know who out there is listening and may um, get on board with that. But yeah, good idea. Uh, upcoming policy intervention, for instance, the upcoming smoking list. Um, you could do, yeah, and that's exactly the sort of thing that it could be used for. Um, yeah, I mean, if what you'd, what you'd have to do there is have some estimates or a range of estimates of what um, what the impact on, let's say, smoking rates was, or maybe the impact on other things. That's the other thing about the micro-simulation. You have to it doesn't have to be linear. You can simulate all sorts of types of things. Could you create a real life sample in IDI with characters of interest and request output? Um, no, <laughs> not really. Um, so I'll take you a little bit through this process. And this is why I thank Chris Ball, actually, is um, we, we, Eileen, simulated individuals within the data lab. So we randomly selected 10,000 individuals. And we match them to their 20 closest neighbors. So you've got 21 people. And then for each characteristic we were interested in, we took a mean. So for binary characteristics, that's a mean of zeros and ones. So are they male or female, that sort of thing. And for continuous characteristics, it's an actual mean. Why did we do it that way? Because everything released from the data lab, all means released from the data lab must have at least 20 in the denominator, and the denominator must be divisible by three. 21 is the smallest number above 20 that's divisible by three. This is the, the method that Chris Ball came up with. 
So we released that, and there was a few other, and I can't remember what they were, but there's a few other ho hoops that we jumped through to show that they it didn't look like real data. Um, so essentially, we didn't release a synthetic base file from the data lab. What we released is the ability to generate synthetic data from the from the data lab. So what we had is 10,000 individuals with a probability of being each thing, and then we could um, roll a dice and and give them that thing. Um, so that's so that's so yes, and there's a few other. Um, few other parties, Alex Wong being an example, Mariana Pika being another example, who are investigating the types of synthetic data that you can get out of the IDI. And I believe also that um, Maori language model, that also involved getting synthetic data out of the IDI. Um, so yeah, so that's what we did. Um, and I thought it was a really clever idea that Chris Ball developed, I think, for his PhD. So it's all within R. So it's an R package called Samario, which was developed by Oliver Mannion and um, developed further by Jessica McClay and Kevin Chang. And um, it's then displayed just in R, in R Shiny. Um, and actually, I think uh, I won't go back there, but there is a link which we might have might have actually. Um, suppressed while we're still developing things. But there is a link to the code. Um, I think there's probably still a link to Samario because it is an R package that, that was developed by Oliver originally and, and, and added to by Kevin and others, Jessica. Um, so yeah, so it's all done with an R essentially. When Oliver first started doing this, it was done in Java. And then he just discovered, he bit by bit transferred more over to R and, dis and discovered basically R can do everything. And once we're in R, we can then display it in a shiny app. Thank you, everyone.